Thank you, Rabbi Greenstein, for not simply those beautiful words that you shared, but the, the friendship and the leadership that you exercise every moment here and throughout our movement. Let me, let me just begin by saying we had a heat wave in New York. So someone saw me yesterday and said, it's just too hot. It's just too hot in New York. You just got to go find some place to cool off. So that was the moment I was heading out, and they said, uh, Rick, I know you're always going somewhere. Are you going somewhere you can cool off this weekend? I said, yes, I am. Where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to Memphis, Tennessee, and then I'm going to spend Shabbat day in Mississippi, <laughs> and I'm going to cool off. They said, are you crazy? <laughs> what we're experiencing here in New York is what they experience every day during the summer. I said. I don't care, I'm gonna be refreshed when I get to Memphis, Tennessee, and that's exactly what has happened. Uh, spent an extraordinary afternoon with your rabbi, seeing the layers of this city and the inspiration that is literally at the heart of this city, it's truly, truly something um, that moved me and I know that continues to animate, not just this great city, but frankly, much of the world that we love. The opening of this week's parasha of Et Hanan, God says, Ale Rosh HaPizgah, says to Moses, get up onto the summit. I don't care where you are walking around, get up onto the summit. And then God says, Visa Enecha, and raise up your eyes and look at the future. Look at what might be. Don't look down, don't look behind, even though nostalgia is good. God is worried that the people will be only looking back. And God says, you may not touch that future with your hands, but you better touch it right now with your vision. So Moses looks out, and he doesn't see only what is. And the commentator Rashi says he didn't just see what was good in the future. He saw everything that was challenging as well. And he saw opportunity. He saw possibility. He saw what your rabbi sees every day. He, he saw what Rabbi Danziger, who I had the privilege of serving at the Central Conference of American Rabbis during his presidency, I got a chance to serve very closely with Harry. Uh, Harry understood how to lift up one's eyes. And Rabbi Greenstein is the kind of rabbi that young rabbis and older rabbis flock to because he's as good as we've got. I don't mean we, the reform movement. I, I mean we, the Jewish people. This man has the gift of leadership, and he's got a strength and a backbone that is exactly what's needed. At the same time, there's a soft and loving and warm side to this man, which is why I'm sure young rabbis just, you know, where's Memphis? I can't find it on the map, but I'm going to Memphis, Tennessee, because <laughs> I want to learn from a master. And I want to be in a congregation. Let's just name this is a great congregation. I know you say, well, Rabbi Jacobs, you probably say that everywhere you go. Um, not exactly. This is one of the great congregations, not just because you were here before we were. The Reform movement took a while to get going. You were already well on your way. And you helped us begin in 1873. And you have been a pillar of strength, eight rabbis in all those years. That's an example of strength. Past presidents who remain apart, that's a sign of strength. I want to also single out Honey and Rudy Scheidt, who I know are beloved members of this congregation. But I want to tell you, they have visa enecha. They have lifted their eyes and changed our movement in the most concrete and dramatic way. Fifteen years ago, they created the Scheidt Seminar that literally trains new congregational presidents to get clear about what they want to see in the future. Not to just sort of get out and just try to figure it out. Let's get the new presidents together and let's think deeply about the challenges and opportunities of Jewish life. So for 15 years, we've been gathering 
presidents, over a thousand of them each year. At any one time, one third of the presidents serving our movement have been trained at the Scheidt Seminar. It is changing our movement. It is giving leadership the tools to see what might be, not only to see what is. That is the gift of leadership. So to your president, Paula Jacobson, I say, you, you've got the, the, the whole, you know, the whole inspiration here for great uh, training and great apprenticing of what it means to be a Jewish leader. So when it comes to lifting your eyes and seeing what's possible, this is a congregation that lifts all of our eyes. So can I tell you a story? Do you, do you know that people in New York move a little bit more quickly than the people? <laughs> I, I found that out. I wanted to get a cup of coffee at the Starbucks. And the nice man who was getting me the, the cup of coffee was moving in such a beautiful. <laughs> it, it was, it was kind of it was kind of like a beautiful modern dance or a Tai Chi. It was very slow. It was very deliberate and intentional. And I, I have to say that New Yorker in me just kind of like was rising up. So I, I offered to buy him a cup of coffee. <laughs> he said, what's your hurry? I said, you're right. What is my hurry? Um, but let me tell you, I was downtown in New York City hustling to a meeting and I was late. And that's, of course, what life is like. We're always late in New York. And I was running down Broadway to a meeting, and to my right, there was an African-American woman. To my left, there was a, a, a Latino man. I didn't know them, but we were all hurrying. And as we're hurrying, there's a giant trailer, one of these kind of mobile homes blocking Broadway. It was the mitzvah tank. It was the Chabad Lubavitch Mobile. So I thought to myself, you know what? If I go down Broadway, I'm going to be delayed. I will never get to my meeting. I should duck down a side street and just make my way around. And then a little just voice in my ear said, you're a Jewish leader. Don't do that. Walk down the street and be a leader. So I walked in my fast pace down the street. And the Chabad rabbi looked at the three of us, and he picked me out. <laughs> and he said, excuse me, are you Jewish? And I said, yes, I am. Are you? <laughs> this man could not utter sounds. He, he was pointing to his black fedora, his beard, his black coat, his seat seat. He just kept pointing. And I said, you know, well, appearances are not always reality. And I kept walking. He's still standing right there. Now, why do I tell you that story? I don't tell you that story because I have anything less than utter praise and regard for what Chabad does in the world. But I tell you that story because it truly echoes in all of our lives that he was operating with an out-of-date notion of who we are. There was simply no way for him to pick me out, not in the year, not in the year 2013, not in the year 5773. I could have been the one Jewish person. I could have been the one person who was not a member of the Jewish people. So he was basing it on appearances. I think, unfortunately, in our world, we do that all too often. We actually have a brand new study of the New York Jewish community that predicted that we're shrinking, especially reform and conservative. And it was such a depressing survey that at the end, you would led to believe that, you know what, the last person out, please turn out the lights. We're somehow going to shrink. We're going to just become small. And then we're going to just disappear. We the reform and we the conservative movement. But I actually believe if we change how we think about who we are, we have the possibility to grow, not just in numbers, but in depth, so that we become what we were meant to be if we lift our eyes and see what is possible. Now, can I just? see by a show of smiles how many people in the congregation tonight loved Hebrew school or religious school. Go ahead, show me a smile if you loved Hebrew school. Okay, I want to see both of you after the service. <laughs> I know both of you went to Temple Israel's religious school, but it turns out that one of the things that's happening in Jewish life is we have many people who started out in Hebrew school. I was dropped off. My mom and dad would drop me off at Hebrew school 
but they were always in a hurry. This is kind of a theme here, you got that? Um, so my mom had to get back to work, so she didn't stop the car, she just slowed down. <laughs> and she pushed me out and she'd say to me, she'd say, go get Jewish knowledge, get Jewish connection, and I'll be back in an hour and 15 minutes. And friends, we got a lot of people who aren't right now in our circle because they weren't touched by something that really nourished them. And so they passed in and then they passed beyond. We got more people who are not a part of what we do, who actually either experienced something that was less than inspiring or never even experienced any part of what we do. And we have the opportunity to put our literal arms and movement around and bring them close and to draw them in to what we're all about. But we have to think beyond even the great walls of a congregation like Temple Israel here in Memphis, Tennessee. Because all those folks, the folks that were walking down Broadway, uh, they're waiting, many of them, to find a spiritual home, to find a place where worship inspires, where it's connected to the world I live in, to the, to the values and the challenges of being in the modern world and yet be rooted in something ancient and something profound that gives me direction as I move through the world. Parshat ve'et Hanan has an expression of the core of Judaism. It's an unbelievable parsha. It's got everything. So besides the opening, v'sa'inecha, open your eyes, we have a six-word phrase that becomes the very holy of holies for us as we pray and live spiritual lives. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It's not only in the prayer book, it's from Devarim, it's from this parsha. Six words. Six words that distill the very core of who we are. Now, I, I remember being told it was the watchword of our faith. I, I remember being told that God is one, but it didn't really make any sense to me spiritually until I realized not only is God one, but the world that God created, we are one in God, with God, and that oneness is everywhere we look if we if we raise our eyes, look beyond and look within. So when we think about what is Reformed Judaism, it's not often what I hear. So often I hear people, when they're asked what is Reformed Judaism, they get into this giant litany of what we don't do. Maybe it's happened to you. you, you someone asks you at a, at a gathering, at a party, or on the street, well, you're part of Temple Israel, that's a Reformed Temple. What, what are you about? And I hear people over and over again say, well, you know, we don't all fast on Tisha B'Av, and we don't all keep all the commandments, and we don't wear talitot, and we don't wear kippot, and we don't, and we don't, and we don't, and we don't. At the end of that litany, I always think, why would anyone want to be a part of us if we can't actually say, like the Shema Yisrael, like the Aseret Hadibrot, which are also in Parashat V'Echanan. I mean, literally, it's all there. Just grab it. If we can't articulate what it is that is at the core of our Reformed Jewish identity. So I'd like right here and right now six words of the Shema. I'd like six words that capture the essence of what we stand for, that we could not just articulate here in this moment, but we could carry it with us, and we could share it proudly and it would reflect who we are uniquely. Again, we're not the only authentic Jewish path in the world, but we are one very powerful and compelling Jewish path, so we ought to be able to distill it and to share it. So I need six words that capture the ikar, the essence of what we in Reformed Judaism are all about, what expresses our core. So let me, again, this is not a rhetoric. again, maybe you have sometimes rhetorical questions where rabbis pose a question and we're on to the next thought. That's a real question. I want six really clear, compelling things that describe what we are, what we do, what we aspire to. Six. Where's, who's got the first one? Let me hear. We care. we care. Okay, so by the way, you could capture a whole lot. You got the opening right after... 
Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, you have ve'ahavta, right? Love God, ve'ahavta et re'achecha. Love your neighbor, love others, care, right? Now, we may not have the, the market sown in Jewish life about caring. I hope we don't. But it's at the core of what we hold precious, that we care not just about one another, which we do deeply. We care about a world. We care about a community. We care about people who think, pray, and vote differently than we do. We care. Good. So let's get, we got one, we only have five more to go. Okay, ho hold on. Don't give me all at once. I need one more. Put your hand up. Who's got the next one? Yes. We heal. We're healers. Again, it doesn't mean that we're all physicians or nurses. It means that we can bring healing to the world. So caring is a deep inner place. Healing is what we do. And we can heal a broken heart. We can heal a sense of loss, a sense of disappointment. We also can heal a world. Uh, when we went to the Civil Rights Museum right here in Memphis, stood outside of uh, room 306, the Rain Hotel, we, we can heal uh, a world. Uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, his death demands, uh, calls us to heal, to heal a nation, to heal our sense of justice, our sense of right. Without judging what happened, we've got to heal our community so we can find a way to move on. We got care and heal. What else is at the heart? So if you have a past president who puts up their hand, you got a call on a past president. Yes. Thank you, justice. For us, justice is not a suggestion. It's not a profession. It's a calling. We are called to create a just society. That just society is here in the United States. It's in Canada. It is in the state of Israel. It's everywhere. We are called to be those who pursue justice and shape a just world. So we can't be just busy with our own ritual. We can't only be busy with our own deep study. We actually have to shape through our actions, through our caring, through our healing, through our idealism, we have to shape that more just world. So we're doing real well here. We got care, heal, justice. I think we're on the way to capturing. Well, think of the things that are missing. Obviously, we could do nuances on those three. Think of the things that are missing from our six words if we're going to have to hold those. Again, we got, we got past presidents literally lining the pews tonight. So we're, we're here because of you. Yes. We remember. So often people say about Reform Judaism that it's Judaism light, that we don't remember our history, we don't remember our tradition. But in remembering, it means that we reconnect, remember, to literally connect with that which has gone before us. And it may be a, a, an experience that is very painful, it may be an experience that is literally inspiring, but we remember and carry that as an inspiration and as an obligation. Because on Tisha B'Av, just these few days ago, we remember that our history isn't only a history of triumph and a history of healing, it's also a history of being literally um, cast aside and oppressed in history. Good, so we have two more. So again, I don't wanna put pressure on anyone. These gotta be great ones to fill us out. Think of what's missing, we've got caring, healing, justice, and remembering. I'm going in the back because I don't want to think that I only can see in the front. Responsibility. Responsibility. G different than justice because, again, justice is a particular kind of responsibility. Responsibility, we're not just here for a ride. We're not here to enjoy alone. We're here to actually take responsibility for one another. And that is literally, of all the obligations, that may be the most encompassing and frankly, the one that should not be narrowed at any point, a sense of deep responsibility that calls us to act in personal, interpersonal ways, but also in, in communal and in global ways as well. Our last, our last word to, yes, family. family. There's got to be a sense that we are part of this family. And this family is here in Memphis. This family, I'll tell you, is all throughout North America, almost a million and a half of us. Uh, in the reform movement, but we're part of much more than just this great movement. So let me spend my last moment just thinking about how we're part of something larger. 
Because even being part of a great movement or a great congregation, that's not the whole Jewish experience. Jewish experience says we're part of something bigger and we're responsible one for the other. So you remember this past Thanksgiving, the rockets were still falling from Gaza onto the south of Israel, as far as Tel Aviv and as far as Jerusalem. And I uh, was looking forward to the weekend. My kids were coming home. We we're going to have a wonderful family celebration. Sense of responsibility said, you've got to be in the south of Israel. Got on a plane with a group of North American Jewish leaders, and we want to be in the south with the people who were literally living in bomb shelters. And we went to visit a 19-year-old soldier who had been hit by a rocket and was in intensive care unit at the Soroka Hospital in Beersheba. So we were a big group of Jewish leaders, and it was a small ICU. So Malcolm Honline, who's the, the executive vice president of the Conference of Presidents, says, we can only put three people in there. So let's get three rabbis. Rabbi Steve Weil from the Orthodox Union, Rabbi Steve Warnick from the conservative movement, and Rick, you're in there too, representing the reform movement. So three of us went in. And this Golani sword, 19-year-old uh, Mizrahi from a kind of a Middle Eastern background, lying there with a contraption around his leg, uh, his mom doting over him, having baked things. We, we talked with him. He was very optimistic he was going to be fine, recover use of his leg. All he wanted to do was get back with his unit. So what did we do? We prayed for healing. That's what we do no matter what movement we're in. That's a part of what we do. And we were literally being whisked out of ICU when I happened to see a man lying in another bed who looked like he also had a contraption around his leg. So I asked the nurse, what's, what's the matter with that gentleman? And she said, well, no, he had a similar uh, incident. A rocket landed right next to him and shattered his leg. But he's from Thailand. He's a foreign worker. And he was on a tractor next to the Gaza Strip on a Moshav. I said, well, has anyone visited him? The nurse said, not a soul. I said, does he speak Hebrew or English? And she said, just a little. So I said to my colleagues, uh, we got another member of the family here. Not a member of the Jewish people, but a member of God's family. So before we rushed out and went to see the other people who needed attention. This man became part of our family, our circle of responsibility, our sense of healing and caring. We said Misha Be'ach with him. And I tell you that story because I think in Reform Judaism, we have a sense of our family, our circle. But we have at the very same moment an obligation to the rest of God's family. That's what I see in your rabbi. That's what I see in your congregation, that you lead in terms of civil rights, in terms of interfaith relations here, you, you literally take your arms and reach way beyond this place and bring the world closer to you. Uh, the next to last day that I was in Israel two weeks ago, I had a chance to meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Why? Because of you. Because he knows that we are the largest movement in Jewish life. And he wanted always, in such a visit, to have a chance to talk. So I went with Natan Sharansky, who heads the Jewish agency, who was a prisoner of Zion and former Soviet Union, one of the really inspirational people. The two of us had a meeting with the Prime Minister about the Kotel, about the Western Wall. And I first thanked the Prime Minister that he took the leadership to appoint Natan Sharansky to make sure that the Western Wall that many of us visit has a place for all of us whether we're ultra-Orthodox, whether we're conservative, reform, or secular, uh, it has to be one wall for one people. And it had been told to many of us that that commitment that Sharansky had been asked to create a better way was being discarded. So I said to the Prime Minister, are you committed to making Natan Sharansky's vision of one Kotel for one people? He said, I am 100% committed to making that happen. There are many obstacles, but I will make sure that North American Jewry, particularly the reform movement, feels that Israel is theirs in all ways and that they will be at home in every part of the land, in every part of what you do. So we're part of something larger. It's part of the different movements. It's part of the different places, whether it's 
Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Kiev, Minsk, Buenos Aires, wherever we are, we are part of something larger that calls us to not only responsibility, but it calls us to lead communities and lives of purpose and depth. Communities that know about spiritual practice of what we experienced tonight with Shabbat. This kind of renewal would draw me back over and over again to experience what Shabbat could be. This congregation that stands for something, that stands for values and commitments and, and, and justice and inclusion and tolerance and serious learning. I saw the different levels of Hebrew. This is not a place where you only get the intro to anything, but you get the other layers. This is a place that exemplifies what could be if we lift our eyes. So I leave you tonight, and I pray I'm going to come back maybe in the winter time. <laughs> uh, maybe the springtime or just the, the fall, uh, but, but any time it will be refreshing to come back, that I come back and I want our movement to, to be inspired by the way you lift your eyes. What you see, what you make possible, what you not only envision, but what you carry in your arms and in your hearts. So I say to you, let all of us lift our eyes. Visa enecha. Let us look out at the Jewish future. And let's not see shrinking. Let's not see only nail biting. Let's see opportunity that we could broaden who we are, reach beyond our self conceptions and our limitations, include those who actually are searching for what we do, what we believe and that we could make this a moment not of only possibility and hope, but a moment of responsibility to the Jewish future. We've got bold and important work to do, and what I want to tell you is that this great Temple Israel is doing it in the most inspirational ways. So beacons of light will move from not only this sanctuary, from this temple, and we pray that beacons of light will also come to you and help you to feel part of that larger sense of we, that larger sense of Shema Yisrael, that we are part of God's oneness. And that oneness summons us to responsibility, to care, to heal, to remember, to stand for justice, and to be responsible. On this Shabbat Be'et Hanan, on this Shabbat Nachamu, Necha. please join our movement join all those who are building the Jewish future by lifting your eyes and seeing what we can create together. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>